organizations need to do two basic things. They need to just do their day-to-day -day things, you know, make sure that the bills go out, that the money gets collected and deposited, that sort of thing. And they also need to make decisions. Now those decisions vary wildly, the nature of those decisions. Some of them are very run-of-the-mill, regular decisions that they may make every week. Like for example, um, we said how many hamburger buns should the cafeteria order? That's a decision that the, that the person in charge is going to need to make. I don't know if they do it every week, but on some very periodic basis. All right. Other decisions might be uh, of a bigger nature. Let me give you an example. I worked in a car rental company in their IT department uh, years ago. And one of the things they did, they had a bunch of cars with a bunch of offices, is they wanted to get like the right mix to make sure that there weren't a lot of cars sitting there, sitting around, you know, waiting to be rented. You know, what makes a brand successful and not successful depends on a lot of different things, right? You know, uh, in certain places there's a lot of tourism, so there's a lot of car rentals there. You know, in other places maybe bad weather causes a lot of accidents, so there's car rentals there. Maybe the sales staff and the manager is better at marketing in one branch than another, so they do a better job renting their cars regardless of the situation. So we were, so, so they were always trying to get like the right number of cars in the right place. And every day they had a report called the car count report. And that had to be on like all the manager's desks by, you know, certain time of the day. That's like the, you know, that, you just had to do that, right? And they would look at utilization. You know, a, a, a branch has 100 cars and 80 of them were rented. Well, that was reasonably good. You know, you can't necessarily expect to rent all of them all the time. In fact, if you're renting all of them all the time, in a way, I won't say that's bad, but you should get them more cars then. I thought someone was really excited to come to class. <laughs> Went tearing by. All right. And so if, if, a, if a branch is consistently renting out 100% of their cars, you know, you might want to get them a few extra, right? Because maybe they can rent those out too, or maybe uh, if someone comes in that doesn't have a reservation, they'll have a car for them, and so on. So that's the decision that was made on a regular basis. And the managers would look at these reports over time and decide and, and shift their cars around. Each, uh, there were regional managers and district managers and so on and so forth, and they would switch cars around, you know, to get the right mix to try to maximize the profitability. So that's a decision that was made on a regular basis. Other decisions at the car rental company was made, um, you know, not on any kind of regular basis at all. But for example, should we open a new branch? You know, should we? Or is there an opportunity for us to grow our business by opening another branch in Texas? All right. So businesses do their day-to-day -day processing. You know, mailing the bills out, collecting the money, depositing the money. Businesses make decisions. Some of those decisions are very regular. Some of those decisions are sort of one-time only. They call those ad hoc decisions, as needed. They'll make those decisions. In any case, for all of these things, organizations need information to do it. Or they ought to do it based on information. You know, uh, organizations shouldn't just open a branch in Texas based on a hunch. There should be some good statistics, you know, of what the population is and different other characteristics. So, an organization needs information. By information, I mean something that's usable, actionable. Information is derived from data. Data being the raw facts. So, getting back to should we open a, a new branch uh, in, in Dallas? All right. The population of Dallas might be a piece of data. All right. How many other car rental companies there are in Dallas? How many other branches are there might be a piece of data. How much it would cost for us to open up an office and staff it might be a piece of data. Well, how many cars we would expect to rent every month or every week or, or every year or whatever might be a piece of data. All these things are pieces of data by themselves. And taken together, 
they become something meaningful that a manager can look at and come to a decision. Yeah, based on the data I have, you know, we should open a branch, or no, we shouldn't. So, data is a raw facts. It gets transformed into information. How does it get transformed into information? Well, we described a couple of ways there. It can get transformed into information by combining with other data. You know, if we, if we say looked at only the price of opening an office, it might be very expensive to open an office in Dallas. But we might be able to rent a lot of cars. All right? So just because it's expensive doesn't mean we don't do it, right? We have to look at everything taken together. So one way that this raw data can be transformed into information is to take it and combine it with other pieces of data. Other things that can be done is data can be filtered. That big old car count report that I talked about that showed every branch at the rental car company and, uh, you know, was literally uh, stacks of paper, you know. Um, maybe a manager doesn't want to see everything. Maybe the manager only wants to see, see those offices in his district that gets less than a 70% utilization, all right? In other words, if you're doing a good job, you know, why do I need to see that report, you know, for you? If you're renting out, 80, 90 percent of your cars, you're doing a good job. Keep up the good work. Pat on the back. Maybe the guys that are renting less than 70 percent of their cars, however, you want to go and have a talk to and figure out what they can do to, to get their numbers up. All right? So that's a case of filtering. We're not interested in everything. We're interested in just some things that meet a certain criteria. Maybe we're interested in summarizing. All right? Let's say I was in charge of this area for the car rental company. Maybe my Lorraine branch is doing good and my Illyria branch isn't doing so good, but taken together, this whole area, we're doing a good job. So maybe one of the reasons Illyria isn't doing so good is because a lot of people are going to the Lorraine branch instead. Yeah, not that big a deal. Taken together, we can summarize our data and look at this region as a whole, and as a whole, we're doing good in this region. All right? These are three ways that data, those raw facts, can be transformed into, into information. We made two observations about this process. Number one is the more flexible you can be, the better it is. Flexible is good. I don't know if grammatically that's correct, but I think you get the idea. Notice if you can only see your data one way, you're limited as to the kinds of information you can pull from that data. If you can see data arranged in a bunch of different ways, you have more information from the same data. You're able to see that information, you're able to see that from different viewpoints and maybe piece together the whole picture. It's like the old proverb they tell of getting uh, a group of blind men to describe an elephant, right? You know, one, one touches the, 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 what do they call that, the nose, the trunk. trunk, thank you. One touches the trunk and says, you know, hey, an elephant's like a rope. One touches the leg and says, uh, elephant is like a, uh, uh, a tree trunk. One touches a tusk and says an elephant's like a stone and so on. Each of those individual views is okay, but really what the view of the ele uh, elephant is, is everything put together. All right. Same sort of idea with this. If data can only be viewed one way, you're only getting a limited picture of the situation. If data can be viewed a bunch of different ways, if there's a lot of flexibility involved with the way that you can take the raw data and present it as information, you're going to have more and or better information, and ideally that should allow you to make better decisions and to run your business better, more effectively. All right? Especially when you consider those ad hoc decisions, right? Because with those ad hoc decisions, we're making decisions uh, today that we may never make again, you know? Should we open a Dallas branch? It's not something we do every week, all right? It's something that we do once, maybe once ever in the course of our con company. All right? And as such, we might not have a K-1 
hand report sitting out there waiting to give me the data that I need or the information I need to decide whether to open a branch or not. But if our data is flexible enough that we can incorporate stuff in from a variety of sources and organize it a certain way, all right, I guess organizing the data is another way that we can do this. If we're flexible about doing that, then we can provide information for a lot of different kinds of decisions. The other golden rule, so to speak, is accuracy. And G-I-G-O, as we said before, garbage in, garbage out. If the raw data somehow isn't good, the information that you pull from that raw data isn't going to be very good. All right? It's just, you know, logical. It makes sense. So where does that leave us? It leaves us here. All right? We're going to consider two possible ways of storing some data. And then we're going to look at it and think about it and think which is a better way to store the data. Which allows us a greater degree of flexibility and um, more, thank you, more accuracy. This is my Friday, by the way. This is my last class of the week. So, uh, for those of you, yeah, this is, this is like 4.30 on Friday for me. So every once in a while the mind wanders a little bit. All right, I do apologize. But I do, I do appreciate the, the help on the word uh, if, if, I get, if I'm grappling for a word. All right, here's one way that we could store data. Let's say we were storing data about classes, sections, and teachers here at LC. All right, we're storing those three Things. The textbook, I think, calls them themes. All right? But we're storing data about these three themes. And a class, you know, is something like CISS 143. Right? It has associated with it a, a name, Database Design and Implementation. It has associated with it a certain number of credit hours, three credit hours, and it might have other characteristics as well. By section, I mean like when the class meets. There is, for example, a daytime section of this class that someone else teaches. There's the evening se uh, se uh, section that I teach, and then there's the internet section. So that's what I mean when I say sections. All right? And finally, teachers, we know, we know what they are. All right? So let's consider a couple of ways that we could store data about sections, classes, and teachers. One way is to store everything in one big old pile of data, All right? like this. Maybe we store something like an Excel spreadsheet. Where we store the class code, the name, the credit hours, the section type, in other words, is it a internet section or a campus section, the days and times that it meets, the room, the instructor name, and maybe the instructor office, you know, where the instructor is located. Now, it, in the book, this is what they call three themes, right? In other words, we have information about the class, information about the section, and information about the instructor. Now, we could store more individual pieces about any of these, right? For the instructor, in addition to the office, we could store the office hours that the instructor uh, is going to keep. We could store the email address. We could store where they went to school. We could store a lot of different things about the instructor. But it serves a purpose just to look at these two or three things for each. All right? We don't have a long enough sheet of paper to, to write a half dozen things. But know that, 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 again, for any one of these themes, or the word I prefer is entities, all right, we could store several one of these. So let's look at what the data might look for this. All right, class code, CISS 143. 
database design and implementation three credit hours it's a day class it meets Monday and Wednesday let's say 9 to 11 and BU 205 the instructor's name is Smith and his office is BU 211 Z all right CISS 143 database design and implementation three credit hours it's a night class it meets Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 10 and it meets in BU 105 and Zellers teaches it and his office is BU 211 J CISS 143 database design and implementation three credit hours an internet class it doesn't have a date and time or a room but it does have a teacher Zellers BU 211 J let's put one more class in CISS um, 216 web development three credit hours it's an internet section and it's taught by Zellers in BU 211 J so one way that we could represent all this data is just to have essentially like a gigantic Excel spreadsheet that has a row for every class section and structure that's offered all the way down. That's one way that we could do it. All right. Here's another way we could do it. We could have three, you know, this way is with one giant table, one giant pile. Instead, we could have three little lists. Right, three lists of individual themes. We could, for example, have a class table, a section table, and an instructor table. In the class table, we would store the class code, the name of the class, the credit hours. So here would store CISS. 143 the name database next time I do this lecture I'm going to pick something with a shorter name design and three credit hours CISS 216 web development three credit hours in the section table we could store the fact that there's a day class that meets 9 to 11 in BU 205 and we could point to the course that that section is for right instead of storing all the information about the course we're going to point to it well how do you suppose we're going to point to that class how could we you know if we're making an Excel worksheet how could we indicate that this section is for this class can't draw a line in Excel. Yeah, we need a code. We need a unique code. So what I could do, is, and it would need to be unique, all right? In other words, there couldn't be two CISS 143s. That would mess everything up. But if I store in this table, the section table, if I store the class code for this section, then this section essentially points to that class. You, if you want to know what class this belongs to, the name of the class, you can simply use a class code to look up, all right, CISS, oh, I put 243, I meant 143. CISS 143 is database design and implementation. There's another section of CISS 143 that's an evening that meets from 8 to 10 in BU 105. And finally, there is a CISS 143 internet and there's a CISS 216 internet. We're then going to store the instructors and we're going to store a list of the instructors.
How are we going to tie the instructor into this? What would we do? Go ahead. Into the section, into the section right? Because an instructor teaches a specific section. So, am I going to use the name to tie them? Here we use the class code to tie the section to the class. Would I use the instructor name to tie the instructor to the section? See, so you shaking your head. No, why not? Well, no, uh, what, what I'm saying is what I put, Smith teaches this one, Zellers teaches this one, Zellers teaches this one, Zellers teaches that one. What's, what's wrong if doing that? What could happen if I did that? Yeah, I was going to say, I pick, I was going to say, hint, hint, I pick Smith for, for uh, a reason. What if there were two Smiths, right? Uh, you mentioned uh, that the code needs to be unique. Well, names are probably, how, let me put it this way, names we can't guarantee are unique, right? Um, actually, for a while here at LC, there were two Professor Blonics. One taught business, one taught something else. All right, they were brothers. All right, so if we, if we use the name, all right, um, it wouldn't work. So what are we going to do instead then? If we can't use the name, what could we use? We could maybe use the office, uh, as long as no one shared an office or anything like that. What else could we do? Yeah, just make a number, make up a number, uh, an instructor ID, an instructor code, right? Every student here has a student ID, right? That's how they solve that problem in the student version of these tables. There's a student ID, so if there's two people with your name, you don't get the wrong person's bill, you don't get the wrong person's grade, you don't get the wrong person's schedule, because everything is stored not based on your name, which is kind of shaky whether it's going to be unique or not, but it's stored based on your student ID, which is guaranteed. So we'll do the same thing here. I'll create an instructor ID. So maybe this person's one, two, three, and I'm four, five, six. And then I'll store in this table the fact that one, two, three teaches this class, four, five, six teaches these three. Now I didn't need to do that. I didn't need to make up a number to point to the class table because that class code we know already is unique, right? We know that there is no, there aren't two different classes named by CISS 143. There's two sections, but there's only one. CISS 143 is database design and implementation, regardless of which section it is, and it's three credit hours, regardless of which section it is. So here's our two ways that we could store data. In a giant pile of data, where there are multiple, as the book would say, themes, or I would say there's multiple entities in that pile. And, or rather, or, um, in three different little lists. You know, one big list that contains everything, three little lists that each contains a piece of it. Let's consider this from an accuracy perspective. I'll try to put these so that we can see a bit of each. Do you have any thoughts about the accuracy? Would one of these lend itself to be more accurate than the other? And would be more wh which one? The three tables or the one table? Okay. Okay. That's a huge deal. All right. You know, write that down. Highlight it. Whatever. All right. The more technical uh, way that that is said is this one giant table approach contains redundant data. In other words, how many times am I listed as having an office of BU211J? I'm listed there three times. Well, what does that mean? If I were to change offices and move to BU211A, that's going to be harder to update. Okay, that's going to be harder to update. Because if I don't update all three of them, there's going to be inconsistency. All right? And it might show for two of my classes that my office is BU211J, and it might show for the third class that my office is BU211A, or something like that. All right? That's a big deal. This approach, it doesn't have that issue. 
If I move offices from BU211J to BU211A, boom, I make the change in one place. And that's the only place I need to do it because it's only the only place where it's stored. A uh, person I used to work with called this, you know, only having one version of the truth. All right? Everything is entered only once. Now, it still could be wrong, right? Someone key punching in or, or entering in my office could put in the wrong office, could, could hit, instead of hitting J, hit K, right? So that doesn't guarantee it's accurate. But it certainly helps it because if I notice a problem and I need to change something or correct something, all right, um, I only need to change it in one place. Are there any other issues that relate to accuracy here? Well, let's consider this. Let's consider we hire a brand new teacher that doesn't have any class. Uh, let me, <laughs> doesn't have any courses. <laughs> All right, I gotta be real careful what I say, right? Uh, we hire a teacher that doesn't have any courses. How do we store them? Well, in this scenario, if they're not teaching any courses, there's no class information for them. There's no section information. Would have to like put them in with all the stuff empty. In which case, this no longer is a list of classes. This is a list of classes and, oh yeah, other information, like maybe teachers. All right. If we added a teacher in this scenario and they weren't assigned any classes yet, what would we do? Simple. We can add someone to this list. without worrying about the other lists. So we can treat those independently. All right. So that's another sort of way that this becomes a little more accurate. Let's look at another situation. Let's say Professor Smith is an adjunct professor. All right. Adjunct means a part-time professor. All right. And they only teach that one class. All right. Because usually part-timers teach one or two classes a semester. But let's say that section gets canceled, all right, for whatever reason. So we cancel this class. What happens to that information about Professor Smith? It's gone, <laughs> all right? We intended to cancel a class. Guess what? We took out Professor Smith with it, all right? All these different things are called anomalies. Anomalies uh, is, is a good Scrabble word, all right, uh, to describe odd, unusual, problematic, probably is, a be is another good word for it. Problematic situations that relate when you store data in this way.
Excuse me, Mrs. Uh -huh. And what I just described was an indication, all right, or an example of a lack of referential integrity. All right, whereas we could have a order for a non-existent customer. In other words, the customer should reference uh, a valid customer. But in this case, it didn't. So there's a problem. Databases support referential integrity. What does that mean? That means when I define these different tables, I can set it up so that in the database, the database knows that this instructor ID in the section table relates to this instructor ID over here. Right? Remember, we still have to link these tables together because they're related. Even though they're separate entities, there's relationships between those entities. All right? The section is for a specific class. The section is taught by a specific instructor. So we still have to be able to relate it. And we do that through the use of these IDs. All right? But we can set it up and define it in the database so that um, this has to point to a valid instructor ID. And it doesn't matter how you try to do it. In other words, if this data is stored in a database and referential integrity is enforced, then program A, program B, program C, it doesn't matter who wrote the program. You can't force bad data in. Because the database acts sort of as a gatekeeper to that data and prevents bad data from getting, uh, from getting through. So, what does that do to the accuracy of the data? It also increases it. All right? So when we consider databases as compared to um, other ways, and the other ways are typically called file systems, either flat, sequential files, or index files, or there's a number of different varieties. Probably, if you're not familiar with these sort of systems, probably the best way to think of it is like a collection of like Excel worksheets. All right? The database approach allows for, or has the potential for much more accurate data because, number one, it eliminates redundancy. The data is only stored in one place. Number two, it eliminates the anomalies associated with the file system. That is, the delete, the insert, and the update anomaly. It eliminates redundant data. All right? Um, and in addition to that, we can implement what's called referential integrity. And we can make up that, we can make sure that if two entities in our database are related, all right, that you can't put something in one table that doesn't have a corresponding thing in the other table. And that's a good thing, all right? What would happen at an organization if a payroll check was written for a non-existent employee? So it's known as fraud, right? You know, that would be a problem, all right? Uh, what would happen if there was a class that was assigned to a non-existent professor? Well, it would probably be pretty hard to learn in that class, you know, and so on and so forth. That referential integrity is key, all right? Let's look at the other criteria we have, because accuracy is a knockout for the database approach, right? Not even a decision on points, right? That's a knockout for the database uh, approach. It, uh, there, there's really no way uh, that you can say that a file system is going to, by its design, allow for more accurate data than a database system. The database system wins in every category. What about flexibility? Which do you think allows for more flexibility in reporting? Yeah, the separate tables. Why? Should be pretty intuitive, right? In this case, if I wanted, this gives me a nice listing of all the sections, all right? But what if I wanted to see a listing of all the instructors? Well, I'm in there a few different times, right? You'd have to sort of sort through that and, and, you know, there's not three of me, there's only one of me. So you sort of have to sort through it and figure out, well, gee, this guy's the same as that guy, so we'll only show him once. 
not as straightforward. In this case, with the three tables, I want a list of instructors. I pull it from the instructor table. I want a list of courses that are on campus. I pull it from the class table. What if I want to get this sort of report? Something that shows me all the sections. I can still get that because the data in these tables are related. I can look and say this section. What class does it relate to? It relates to CISS 143. Let's look it up in that table to find the name of the course and the credit hours. Who teaches this class? Instructor 123. What's that instructor's name? It's Smith and here's their office and so on. So the table approach is more flexible as far as reporting is as well. All right. So really, there's not much to recommend file-based systems. Um, that's why virtually every application today that's written is written based off of a database system. Um, you might get some old, what, what typically are called legacy applications that might still use a file-based system. But for the most part, any new application developed there's really not much to recommend um, the, uh, the non-database approach. Um, I guess it could be slightly cheaper because with the database approach you have to have a database management system where you really don't need that with files. Um, oddly enough, despite eliminating redundant data, databases typically take up more space than the file systems because in addition to storing the data, the relationships are stored in the database as well. So, um, but you know what? Those are like minor disadvantages as compared to the big advantages of flexibility and increased accuracy. All right. What I would like to do is I had a question from an online student about the homework. Yes. Yeah, the database actually takes up more space than a file-based system because with the database, in addition to storing the, the, the individual pieces of data, those little pointers that I drew are actually stored as data in the database as well. And the fact that there's constraints is stored in the database. More than just the raw data is stored in a the database. There's, uh, and they call that like overhead, all right? It's additional data that, that's needed to keep everything running. Plus you have the database management system which is itself a large program, takes up space and so on. So, um, you know, slight disadvantage. It's, it's definitely not enough of a disadvantage to say, hey, you know, let's go back to the file approach, you know. Uh, this space is cheap, you know, as compared to the risk of, of invalid data. All right. Can I borrow someone's book? Let's look, uh, I want to look at the one piece of the homework assignment. The Garden Glory questions. Let's zoom in here. <clears throat> what they essentially want you to do is to walk through the examination of this particular problem, all right, similar to what I did with the two different ways of, of one big pile of data versus breaking it down into entities. So that what they want you to do is they want you to create a list of owners and properties, all right. Um, so for part A, it's going to look something like this. Guard Glory is like a landscaping firm, hypothetically. Um, they want you to make a list of properties and owners. So for part one, it might start out like this. There might be The address of the property, the city, the state, the zip, I don't know, maybe some other information, a description, the type of property, is it commercial or residential or whatever. And then there might be like an owner name, owner phone, and other pieces of data about the owner. 
So that's sort of it for part one, right? You want to make one big table that contains a list of all the properties and their owners. Now, you should then see some of the same sort of redundancies we saw in my example. In other words, 111 Jones Street might be owned by Bill Smith and 222 Washington Drive might also be owned by Bill Smith, which means that, hey, that owner's phone number is in there two places. All right? So that's sort of what you do for part one. You make a list. You don't need to create this in Access. You can just do a list in a Word document, in an Excel worksheet. It doesn't really matter. Um, then you do the process of breaking it down. All right? I think part two asks the question, describe the, modif uh, describe the modification problems that you'd get uh, if Garden uh, Glory uh, uh, um, attempts to maintain the data this way. Well, again, what if um, that owner ch uh, moves and has a different phone number? Well, it's in two places. You could potentially uh, get it inconsistent. So what do you do? Well, you split it out. Now remember, when you split it out, you still have to relate the two together. There still has to be a way for a property to point to the owner that owns that property. Just like we still needed a way to, for the section to point to who taught the course and the section to point to the course that, that uh, the section was for. So that is the next step then. You break it down and show what it's going to look like and then show that that addresses the problem. In other words, if I had a separate owner table, each owner would only be in there once and therefore I couldn't have an inconsistent phone number. Then it asks you to do one more thing. Since, since Garden Glory is a, uh, supposed to be a landscaping firm, let's say that they can perform a variety number of services at each place. You know, maybe one place they cut the grass, one place they cut the grass and trim the hedges. All right. Again, they want you to walk through the process of making a big old list, a big pile of data that has all that stuff in it and then breaking it down into its pieces. Again, put it in a Word document, put it in an Excel document, um, that's fine. The, the student that asked me about this did note that none of those are questions, you know, and I said do the Garden Glory question. And I had to say, that's true, uh, but I was just referring to the label in the book. All right, I didn't make that up, so yes. So we're supposed to do it in like order itself first and then recreate it? No, this particular piece you don't need to do in Access at all. Okay. So you would just... You would do essentially like I'm doing here, except in a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet. You do have an access assignment, all right, uh, but um, that you can read through and it's pretty simple creating the tables. If anyone needs help again, I'll be glad to help them in lab. All right, that's it for me. Um, we'll see you over in lab.